A Treaty on the Law of Notice. It was Affecting Civil Rights and Remedies by William P. Wade, published 1878. The Law of Notice, Chapter 1, The Different Kinds of Notice, Actual and Constructive. Actual Notice, Sections, Conflict of Authority as to what is actual notice, Causes of the Apparent Conflict, Distinction between Knowledge and Notice, same with illustration, different kinds of actual notice, express notice, direct information, notice by implication, disregard of notice amounting to fraud, circumstances sufficient to put upon a inquiry, knowledge imputed to one who has the means of knowing, notice to purchasers when actual, facts sufficient to excite inquiry, possession insufficient, Title papers, possession held, sufficient. Purchaser to use diligence, purchaser of equitable interest, vendor's lien, purchaser from mortgagor, notice of trust, purchaser from insolvent trustee, suspicious circumstances, inadequacy of price, relationship between the parties, notice of partnership interest, information sufficient to put upon inquiry, Different sources of information, vague statements disregarded, degree of certainty required, notice to an agent, principal not benefited by agent's fraud, how principal affected by notice to agent, purchaser after fruitless inquiry, information allaying suspicion, the effect of reliance on information from doubtful sources. One, conflict of authority as to what is actual notice. The term here is used to designate the branch of the law of notice, which does not rest upon mere legal inference or presumption, and to distinguish it from what is properly called constructive notice, which seem to be sufficiently definitive of its own meaning to pass without further gloss or comment. On its face, it would appear to import its character so clearly and unmistakably as not to depend for elucidation upon judicial construction and yet the decisions upon this question are far from harmonious. Even in this country, and the contrariety of view between the courts of Great Britain and the United States is equally perplexing and unsatisfactory. Two, causes of the apparent conflict. The conflict of authority is more apparent, however, than real. A careful examination of some of the cases in which the most contradictory methods of classifying the kinds of notice there considered discloses the fact that much of the confusion arises from attempts to give general definitions, which shall embrace just sufficient to be applicable to the cases decided in the same manner as they are applied to precedent cases where the same principles are involved. A term incapable of being disposed of in a brief definition may be thus loosely explained and convey a meaning sufficiently clear and distinct for the purposes of the case, but when there is an attempt to apply the definition thus hastily constructed to other cases, it may express too much or too little. Three, distinction between knowledge and notice. Actual notice has been defined by declaring that it exists when knowledge is actually brought home to the party to be affected by it. This excludes all notice which does not amount in fact, as well as theory, to actual knowledge. There can be no doubt that this definition is too narrow. If we are to be confined constrictly to what would be considered in metaphysics as actual knowledge, it will be necessary to banish the term from our statutes, and the courts will be compelled to abandon it as unfit for judicial use. Scarcely any fact can be communicated in a manner so direct as to exclude every possibility of doubt as to its authenticity. Absolute knowledge in the strict sense of the term imports so high a degree of certainty as to the matter to be established that to require it in every instance would render the adjustment of differences between man and man on any just basis practically impossible. Courts must at best be content with such an approximation to perfect knowledge as the natural imperfections of human recollection will afford. And if this term, like all others employed to express the intention of legislative bodies, is to be subjected to judicial construction, 
there seems no good reason why it should not be constructed in harmony with the whole body of the law, and so as to effectuate the purposes for which laws are intended. Same with illustration. The courts have accordingly refused to confine actual notice within the narrow limits of the definition quoted above. Their departure from the rule that renders actual notice and actual knowledge as a synonymous as synonymous terms is perhaps most conspicuous in cases arising under the registry laws, where in order to give precedence to a prior unrecorded instrument over a subsequent one affecting the same land, which has been duly recorded, it is necessary to prove that the subsequent purchaser had actual notice of the prior unregistered instrument. To follow the strict letter of Bouvier's definition and bring actual knowledge home to the subsequent purchaser, nothing would suffice less certain than the presence of the party to be affected when the prior instrument was executed, and a careful inspection thereof by him with sufficient knowledge of the premises described to enable him to identify the property conveyed as that of which he subsequently becomes the purchaser, and even this might fail to fix him with actual knowledge at the time of the subsequent purchase. There would be nothing to prevent his interposing as an excuse his inability to understand the import of the prior deed or from declaring that the first transaction had passed out of his recollection when the second took place. This would leave the question of knowledge after all to be determined by the evidence. The main fact would depend upon the inference to be drawn from collateral circumstances. But where one purchased a piece of land of which there was a former conveyance, the registration of which was absolutely void on account of the absence of the necessary certificates to the acknowledgement, and the subsequent purchaser was informed by his attorney employed to investigate the title that such void registry had been made, it was held that this information was sufficient to put him upon inquiry and take it in con connection with other collateral circumstances of a less significant character would warrant the conclusion that the subsequent purchaser had actual notice of the prior deed. This was several removes from actual knowledge. Different kinds of actual notice. Number five, there are two classes of actual notice, which for convenience may be designated as express one, okay, within here we have one, and we have two. One express, two implied. So now one express, which includes all knowledge of information or in express, which includes all knowledge or information coming to the party to be charged of a degree above that, which depends upon collateral inference or which imposes upon him the further duty of inquiry, and two, implied, which imputes knowledge to the party because he is shown to be conscious of having the means of knowledge, though he does not use them. In other words, where he chooses to remain voluntarily ignorant of the fact, or is grossly negligent in not following up the inquiry which the known facts suggest. Section six, express notice. The first of these case class, uh, <laughs> the first of these classes is easily and briefly disposed of. Not only would it embrace what might fairly be called knowledge from the fact that it was derived from the highest evidence to be communicated by the human senses, but also that which is communicated by direct and po positive information, either written or oral from persons who are personally cognizant of the fact communicated. Section 7, Direct Information. It has been decided in several cases where the information came from those whose means of knowledge were of an inferior sort. This, that this notice to effectually bind subsequent purchasers must come from parties in interest. And in other cases, it is decided that the statements of third parties who are ignorant of the facts will not amount to notice but it has been held in a case in which the inadequacy of the vague and uncertain conjectures of those unacquainted with the facts is fully recognized. 
that where the communication comes from, those who speak advisedly of the matter or from information in their possession of a definite character, the notice will be sufficient to affect the con conscience of the purchaser. In some of the cases cited, however, notice obtained by information is regarded as of that character, which has the effect of putting the purchaser upon inquiry. But when the information comes directly from the party in possession of full knowledge of the facts communicated, and is so full and complete as to all the essential details of the matter as to carry conviction to an ordinary mind, it would properly be classed as express notice, though it stopped far short of what might be correctly termed absolute knowledge. Section 8, Notice of Implication. Implied notice includes neither positive knowledge nor information so direct and unequivocal as necessarily to carry conviction to the mind of the person notified. Neither does it belong to that class which depends upon legal presumption. It is circumstantial evidence from which the jury, after estimating its value, may infer notice. It, dif it differs from express notice for the reason that the latter is supposed to be absolutely convincing in itself, while the former merely suggests to the mind of the person to be thereby affected. The existence of the fact to which the, his attention is directed and points out the means by which he may obtain positive and convincing information. It differs on the other hand from constructive notice with which it is frequently confounded and which it greatly resembles with respect to the character of the inference upon which it rests. Constructive notice being the creature of positive law or resting upon strict legal inference, all implied notice arises from inference of fact. Section nine, disregard of notice amounting to fraud. An example of these distinctions as drawn by the courts is furnished by the holding in a case between a party claiming under a prior unregistered deed and one claiming under a subsequent registered, is that right? registered conveyance, similar to that already cited. There, the court decided under a statute requiring actual notice to enlarge, hmm, no, to charge subsequent parties with notice of prior unrecorded instruments or equitable claims that the party claiming under the unrecorded deed was not required to prove that the subsequent purchaser had certain knowledge of the prior conveyance, such as he would have if he had seen the first deed executed and delivered to the grantee. It was held that something less than positive personal knowledge of the fact of the conveyance would be sufficient to constitute actual notice within the true intent and meaning of the statute. The test of sufficiency applied to the notice in this case was that it should be so express and satisfactory to the party as that it would be fraud in him subsequently to purchase, attach or levy upon the land to the prejudice of the first grantee. Section 10, circumstances sufficient to put upon inquiry. Where the matter of which express notice is proved is merely a circumstance collateral to the main fact with notice of which it is sought to charge the party. The collateral circumstance, if sufficient to put him upon inquiry leading to the truth will in general be regarded as good notice of the ultimate fact to be established. All the cases, however, where this doctrine is maintained do not go the length of holding the facts and circumstances sufficient to put the party to be affected upon inquiry would amount to actual notice of such fact, nor evidence from which the jury might infer positive knowledge or express notice, but that it would amount to constructive notice, while others declare quite plainly that such circumstances are actual notice. This difference does not necessarily indicate a conflict between the authorities, but merely shows that the same circumstances from which the jury might infer, as matter of fact, that express notice had been given where constructive notice is sufficient 
would serve as a foundation for the legal presumption, which the party to be charged would not be permitted to deny. Section 11, knowledge imputed to one who has the means of knowing. It is easy to understand how one may be concluded from denying actual notice when positive information has been traced directly to him. It is not necessary to invoke the doctrine of constructive notice in order to justify holding that he will not be heard to deny that he understood the import of what was clearly and plainly communicated. Whether the notice had, has been communicated cannot be determined by the standard of the recipient's stupidity or heedlessness. For the reason, therefore, the ignorance of an important fact which has been placed within the easy reach of the party imports either fraud or gross negligence on his part, the law will never inquire further than is necessary to show the giving of the notice by such means as are sufficient to convey intelligence from one human being to another. It has accordingly been held that when a party having knowledge of such facts as would lead any honest man using ordinary caution to make further inquiries does not make, but on the contrary, studiously avoids making such obvious inquiries. He must be taken to have notice of these facts, which if he had used such ordinary diligence, he would readily have ascertained. 12. Notice to purchasers when actual. A familiar class of cases in which this doctrine is applied is that to which the examples already furnished belong, where the controversy lies between purchasers of the same piece of real estate and the first purchaser holds under an unrecorded conveyance of which it is sought to charge the subsequent purchasers with notice. In a case of this kind arising under the provisions of a statute requiring actual notice of unrecorded instruments in order to affect subsequent purchasers for value, and where the spreading of an instrument upon the records, which for the want of certain formalities was not entitled to be recorded, did not amount to constructive notice under the statute. It was held by Judge Bliss that if the deed was actually put upon record, although not so acknowledged, that is record, that its record would be constructive notice. And if the party saw that record, it would be very strong, if not conclusive evidence of the actual notice required by statute. The object of the Registry Act is to protect innocent purchasers and no subsequent purchaser can be innocent who knew of a previous conveyance, whether it be so acknowledged as to authorize its record or not. And it would be absurd to say that an exhibition to him of a copy of such conveyance made under circumstances that would presume it to be a genuine copy would be no evidence of such notice. The learning judge, the learned judge would probably have gone further had the case required it and laid down the doctrine that one who had seen a copy of the prior deed under such circumstances would be in possession of such notice as to render fraudulent a subsequent purchase by him of the property thereby conveyed. Section 13, facts sufficient to excite inquiry. There is a decided conflict of authority, both English and American, concerning some particular facts, whether they are sufficient to put a purchaser upon inquiry so as to charge him with knowledge of a prior convenience. This conflict cannot be reconciled, nor can anything like a general rule be deduced therefrom, which would not be subject to a multitude of exceptions for the reason that in estimating the effect upon the conscience of the purchaser of particular circumstances brought to his knowledge prior to the purchase, there are doubtless many considerations, purely local in their character, which tend to affect the value of such circumstances as evidence of notice. Section 14, possession insufficient. For example, in Massachusetts where the statute requires actual notice, it is held that proof of open and notorious occupation and improvement would not be, would not be such evidence of ownership in the occupant. 
as to make it the duty of any one cognizant of such facts to make further inquiry before purchasing. And in Lamb v. Pierce, it is held not only that such open and notorious possession and improvement would not be sufficient, but the court goes further and declares that proof of facts which would reasonably put a purchaser upon inquiry would not fulfill the statutory requirements. This, however, goes so far beyond the most recent authority cited in support of the doctrine therein declared that the case may be regarded as unsupported by authority even in that state, so far as it goes beyond excluding possession as evidence of notice. Section 15, Title Papers. The case of White v. Foster referred to last above was where there was an equitable claimant to an interest in real estate who had not placed his claim within the protection of the registry laws. The reservation of this interest was mentioned in a mortgage and the property subsequently conveyed to a purchaser who had no other notice of the interest reserved that the fact that it was mentioned in a mortgage subject to which he purchased. This was held to be actual notice and the court in construing the statute declared that in order to show actual notice, it was not necessary to prove an actual exhibition of the deed. This must be taken as an admission of the efficacy of facts which put one upon inquiry, for it cannot be contended that the subsequent purchaser in this instance was expressly notified of the outstanding equity by the recitals in an instrument affecting his title merely because he had notice of such instrument. The only ground upon which he could be charged with actual notice was that, having notice of the mortgage, ordinary prudence dictated that he should examine it with a view to gaining his knowledge of its contents. Section 16, possession held sufficient. The statute of the state of Missouri provides that instruments affecting the title to real estate should not be valid except between the parties and such as have actual notice thereof until deposited with the recorder for record. This language of the statute is construed by the Supreme Court of that state to mean that any fact from which a jury may infer actual notice would be admissible in evidence to establish that fact. This species of notice is defined as being either knowledge or consciousness of having the means of knowledge, although he may not use them, and of open notorious possession under a claim of ownership by the party holding adversely to the subsequent purchaser is regarded as sufficient to place the means of knowledge within his reach. And from possession, the jury might infer that the subsequent purchase was made with either full knowledge or involuntary ignorance of the adverse claim. Section 17, purchasers to use diligence. In Cambridge Valley Bank v. Delano, the doctrine of actual notice by implication from circumstances is very comprehensively and fully set forth as between adverse claimants to real estate. The most conspicuous fact in this case was the recital and antecedent title papers of the grantor. It was there held that where a purchaser has knowledge of any fact sufficient to put a prudent man upon inquiry, which is prosecuted with ordinary diligence, would lead to actual notice of some writer title. In conflict with that he is about to purchase, it is his duty to make the inquiry, and if he does not make it, he is guilty of bad faith or negligence to such an extent that the law will presume that he made it and will charge him with the actual notice he would have received if he had made it. The same doctrine is also supported by numerous authorities in this and other states. Section 18, purchaser of equitable interest. Where one purchases with notice of the fact that the legal title to the property is in some one else than his grantor, he is thereby put upon inquiry as to the nature and extent of his grantor's title. And if such inquiries would lead to knowledge of circumstances affecting the title, he will be bound as by actual notice of such facts. Section 19, Vendor's Lien. So when the adverse claim 
is a vendor's lien for the unpaid purchase money notice to the purchaser that the title passed without actual payment of the price agreed upon, although the deed contains an acknowledgement of full payment, will be sufficient to put him upon inquiry as to the fact and failing to exercise reasonable diligence as to ascertain whether there has been a subsequent payment, he will be charged with actual notice of what remains unpaid and will hold the title subject to the prior lien. Section 20, Purchaser from Mortgagor. So also the fact that a mortgage appears to have been discharged by a person other than the mortgagee has been held sufficient to excite inquiry as to the reason of the unusual circumstance and the purchaser with knowledge of such fact would be bound by knowledge of all such further facts affecting the title to the property as the inquiry would disclose. Section 21. Notice of Trust. Where the purchaser had knowledge that the property had been purchased by persons who were executors of a will and mentioned as such in one of the deeds, forming a link in the chain of title together with knowledge that such executors held in trust a large estate with unlimited authority to purchase real estate, this was held sufficient to charge the purchaser with notice of the fact that the property purchased was held subject to the trust upon the principle that being possessed of knowledge of distinct facts affecting the title of this com contemplated purchase, he could not close his eyes and screen himself under the plea of ignorance of other facts connected with those already known to him. Good faith rendered it incumbent upon him to make reasonable inquiry, and he took the title charged with the trust of which such inquiry would have informed him. Section 22, Purchaser from Insolvent Trustee. Knowledge of the insolvency of a trustee from whom a conveyance is received in satisfaction of the personal indebtedness of such a trustee would be sufficient to put the purchaser upon inquiry as to the bona fides of the transaction and inequity he would be considered as having notice. Section 23, Suspicious Circumstances. Inadequacy of the price paid under circumstances otherwise of a suspicious character may be sufficient to excite inquiry. When there is a strong... Um, incentive to pass the title to one who will be in a situation to assume the character of a, an innocent purchaser. The gross disproportion of the amount paid to the real value would be such a badge of fraud as to inform the purchaser so loudly of the intended wrong that he will not be permitted to shelter himself. Behind the fact that he did not know of the defect in his grantor's title, as where property worth two or three thousand dollars was conveyed for a consideration of one hundred dollars to one whom the grantor regarded as friendly to himself, and there was no other explanation of the unequal transaction offered by the parties thereto than the friendly relations subsisting between the grantor and grantee. While well, it was an evidence that the property in the lands of the grantor was subject to an adverse equi equitable interest, the purchaser took with notice. Section 24, Inadequacy of Price. So where a bond and mortgage for $8,000 upon which $2,000 of the principal and all the accrued interest had been paid was transferred for only three-fourths its actual value, and the consideration was received in unsaleable goods at 40% above their market price with no intention of using or disposing of them in the regular way, but with a view to sending them to an auction store. These circumstances were held sufficient to put the purchaser upon inquiry as to the ownership of the security, but mere inadequacy of price realized at a sheriff's or other involuntary sale would not tend to put the purchaser upon inquiry for reasons too obvious to require comment. Section 25, Relationship Between the Parties. 
The fact that the grantor was the father of the grantee was held to be evidence of the son's knowledge of a trust subject to which the land was held by the father and property properly went to the jury to enable them to determine that fact. And where an insolvent debtor pressed by his creditors conveyed absolutely all of all his property to his son, a young man without property receiving neither payment nor security, such circumstances were held to proclaim the bad faith of the transaction in such unmistakable terms that a purchaser from the son with notice of these facts could not hold against a purchaser at a sale under an execution against the father. Section 26, notice a partnership interest. It has been held that notice that the property belongs to a partnership is sufficient to charge it in the hands of the purchaser with partnership debts. But it has been elsewhere decided that a purchaser from a surviving partner who held the property in his individual name would not by mere knowledge that it was partnership property be charged with notice of the trust under which his grantor held so as to render the property in his hands subject to the partnership debts. In this latter case, however, it was held that the manner of the transfer being secret and the purchaser knowing that the firm were greatly in debt would suffice to put such purchaser upon inquiry. Section 27, information sufficient to put upon inquiry. Notice by verbal or written information has elsewhere been considered for the most part as express notice, but as there intimated in many instances, the information is regarded on account of the source from which it comes as merely sufficient to put the purchaser upon inquiry, and in some cases would be so vague and uncertain as not even to amount to this. However, where information of the existence of a patent was received through neighborhood report and from the declaration of a stranger that he had seen it, this was held sufficiently certain to be taken in connection with knowledge of possession and cultivation by tenants of the patentee as evidence of notice and would bar the laying a warrant upon the land as waste and unappropriated. And where a mortgagee who had lost the instrument before having it recorded informed the purchaser after the note so secured had been transferred to another, this information was held sufficient to put the party upon inquiry before purchasing and failing to inquire. The mortgaged property was bound in his hands for the debt. So where the communication came from, a stranger who had no connection whatever with the title, the notice was held sufficient to charge the purchaser. Section 28, different sources of information. The character of the person giving unasked advice of this kind is always to be taken into consideration in estimating the value of the information. His relations and intimacy with the parties from whom direct information might naturally be expected to come, his connection with the transaction and his facilities for obtaining information, as well as the degree of knowledge he displays should all be considered before the party Contemplating a purchase can venture with safety to utter disre utterly disregard his advice. Notice coming from a friend or relation of the adverse claimant has been held sufficient, while the vague reports of mere strangers have been held not to affect the conscience of the purchaser. Section 29, vague statements disregarded. Whatever be the source of the information to be affected as notice, either express or implied, it must amount to something more than a vague statement that the vendor's title is subject to an inquiry, to an equity, or coming even from the guardian of the equitable claimant, informing the party that he will purchase at his peril. Such wild statements at the, as these could not put the party upon inquiry for the reason that they do not tend to direct his attention to any specific source of knowledge and it is contrary to reason and common sense that one should be prevented from purchasing by what he might fairly regard as the idle gossip of busybodies. Section 30, degree of certainty required. 
But while it is essential that there should be reasonable certainty as to the facts communicated, it is not to be understood that there should be a full description of the outstanding equity. It suffices if the information is certain within the rule. Id certum est quo certum ready potest. If it directs the purchaser to where he can become fully informed of the particulars, he will be affected by it. If he fails to purchase his inquiries in the direction indicated. Section 31, notice to an agent. Generally, when the doctrine of notice to agents is referred to in the books, it is mentioned as constructive notice, but it seems to be governed to a considerable extent by the rules applicable to actual notice. In the case of Barnes v. McClinton, Gibson C.J., in rendering the opinion of the court, says, the purchaser had actual knowledge through his counsel of the contents of the paper. Notice to the counsel in the same transaction being presumed notice to the client. Section 32, principal not benefited by agent's fraud. To hold that purchasers could never be affected with actual notice through an agent or attorney would be to afford extraordinary facilities to those who wish to take fraudulent advantage of the statutes requiring actual notice of equitable interests or unrecorded instruments affecting titles to real estate in order to charge the purchaser. If the agent or attorney to whom was entrusted the duty of investigating the title and preparing instruments of conveyance should be conveniently blind to whatever promised to disclose an adverse claim outside of the public records or conveniently dumb in regard to such disclosures when made, his principal might be effectually shielded from the consciences of the fraud perpetuated by his representative. It might not sound consistent to say that notice to an agent is actual notice to the principal, but in the event of this question arising under such a statute, it would probably be held that it was a fraud upon the owner of the equity or unrecorded title for the agent to conceal the knowledge acquired in the course of his principal's employment, and the principal would not be permitted to profit by his agent's fraudulent act. Section 33, how principal affected by notice to agent. It may therefore be confidently stated that while notice to an agent is only regarded as the legal equivalent of personal notice to the principal represented in the transaction in which the agent is engaged because of the legal presumption, which is conclusive upon the principal, that the agent in pursuance of his duty will convey the information to his principal. Still, notice to the agent is more than constructive notice to the principal. Even where actual notice is, by statute, alone sufficient to affect purchasers, the fact that actual notice is brought home to the one who represents such principal in the transaction would be as binding upon him as though he had been personally notified. And if the notice comes to the agent in the shape of knowledge of circumstances, which should put a man of ordinary prudence upon inquiry, the principal will, by implication, be charged with notice as though he had been personally cognizant of the facts which challenged inquiry from the agent. Section 34, purchase after fruitless inquiry. But where notice is implied from knowledge of facts which point with reasonable certainty to the means of ascertaining the truth of the matter involved, proof that inquiries have been prosecuted with reasonable diligence and the purchaser is led to believe in the absence of any adverse claim or even fails to obtain any further or more reliable information than that which excited his inquiries, he may purchase with security. Section 35, information allaying suspicion.
So where the attaching creditor was informed by the debtor that he had already executed a deed to another, but that such deed had neither been acknowledged nor delivered, and in corroboration of the latter statement exhibited the deed, which was still in his own possession, it was held that the creditor might relay might rely upon the truth of such statement without further inquiry or investigation. Section 36, the effect of reliance on information from doubtful sources. But where the purchaser and his agent had been advised of a contract for the sale of the land by the agent of the prior purchaser, which agent had been prosecuted for embezzling funds in the transaction and subject and subsequently informed the last purchaser that the contract with his principal was broken off, it was held that the subsequent purchaser had no right to rely upon such statements from so doubtful a source. Oh, we're done. Wait, are we done? Let me think. Nope, not done. Constructive notice uh, definitions held same as implied notice. Constructive notice prescribed by statute, distinction between different kinds of notice, different kinds of constructive notice, inference of law, contents of writing known to, par to party executing the same, possession as constructive notice, purchaser pendente lite, Recitals in title paper, possession of deeds. Section 37, definitions. Constructive notice is defined by Chief Baron Iyer as in its nature, no more than evidence of notice, the presumptions of which are so violent that the court will not allow of its being controverted. Judge Story defines it as knowledge imputed by the court on presumption too strong to be rebutted that the knowledge must have been communicated section 38 held same as implied notice these definitions exclude all those cases where the legal presumption of notice is subject to rebuttal or explanation chancellor kent however says I hold him chargeable with constructive notice or notice in law because he had information sufficient to put him upon, upon inquiry. Whatever presumptions of notice might arise from information sufficient to put the party upon inquiry could be explained away by showing that, notwithstanding diligent inquiry was made, it proved fruitless of results or in imputation of knowledge may be rebutted by proof that the party thus sought to be charged was misled and lulled into security by countervailing circumstances or a denial of the information by which inquiry was originally excited. There is another definition more comprehensive in its scope than either of the preceding and is laid down as follows. Constructive notice is a legal inference of notice of so high a nature as to be conclusive unless disproved and is in most cases insusceptible of explanation or rebuttal by evidence that the purchaser had no actual notice and believed the vendor's title to be good. Section 39, constructive notice prescribed by statute while the foregoing definitions of this title are doubtless sufficiently full and comprehensive in the connections in which they are employed, they do not convey a distinct idea of that kind of notice which is constructive, as distinguished from that which is actual, without reference to the connection. For this term includes not only the evidence of notice where the presumptions are violent or the imputation of knowledge from presumptions too strong to be rebutted that such knowledge has been communicated or a legal inference of notice of a high character but it also embraces that which is made conclusive upon the party notified 
by the provisions of a statute without regard to the evidence of actual notice or the actual probabilities of the communication of the knowledge imputed. Section 40, distinction between different kinds of notice. One of the distinguishing features between these two kinds of notice, which seem to glide imperceptibly into each other, is that when the facts upon which the presumption is founded have been ascertained, the question of constructive notice is always for the court, while the question of actual notice is fraudulent, fraudulently submitted to the jury, together with the evidence from which the inference of fact is drawn without charge or instruction. As to the weight of the evidence, the distinction here contended for is well set forth by a learned text writer in the following language. It will have been perceived that the term constructive notice is here used in a somewhat indefinite sense. The same is true in regard to most text writers and judges. This form of expression is applied indiscriminately to such notice as is not susceptible of being explained or rebutted and to that which may be. It seems more appropriate to the former kind of notices. It will then include notice by the registry and notice by list pendants. But such notice as depends upon possession, upon knowledge of an agent, upon facts to put one upon inquiry and some other similar matters, although often called constructive notice is rather implied notice or presumptive notice subject to be rebutted or explained. Constructive notice is thus a conclusive presumption or a presumption of law, while implied notice is a presumption of fact. If this distinction were carefully preserved by writers upon the subject, it would enable us to escape a good deal of confusion in regard to the subject of notice. Section 41, different kinds of constructive notice. The following are conspicuous examples of constructive notice as it affects subsequent purchasers and encumbrancers of real estate. One, notice by registration of instruments affecting the title. Two, notice from title papers through which the title of the grantor is traced. Three, list pendants to which may be added possession by the adverse claimant under, under claim of ownership, all of which, however, are separately treated in the next succeeding chapter. Publication is also a common method of obtaining constructive service, and for that reason, notice served in this manner is generally known as constructive notice. This, like registration, is purely of statutory creation and is consequently subject to strict construction. Section 42, inference of law. The notice which arises from legal inference drawn from facts and circumstances sufficient to put the party upon inquiry is only effectual to charge a purchaser when the circumstances are of such a character that to fail in obtaining the knowledge would be gross or culpable negligence. And this we have seen is only distinguished from that kind of actual notice arising from inference of fact by the most shadowy line. Judge Gibson in Wadler v. Farmers Bank of Lancaster says that constructive notice is not prima facie evidence of actual knowledge of fa the fact, the presumption of notice when it arises at all, being conclusive even against the truth of the fact, and therefore constructive notice is always insufficient to fix on a party actual knowledge as the groundwork of express fraud. There might be a case of so gross a nature as to raise a presumption from the fact itself that the judgment creditor knew the debtor to be without color of title. Section 43, contents of writing known 
to party executing same. Where the notice with which a party is sought to be affected is traced through an instrument executed by himself, it matters not whether such instrument constitutes a necessary link in his chain of title. He will be conclusively presumed to have full knowledge of its contents, except where his signature has been obtained by fraud or deceit. Section 44. Possession as constructive notice. The same rules govern whether the purchaser is charged with constructive notice by adverse possession as where such possession is regarded merely as evidence from which the jury are at liberty to infer actual notice. The possession must be clear, open, notorious, and unequivocal at the time of the purchase. Section 45, Purchaser Pendente Lite. Independent of the doctrine by which purchasers Pendente Lite are affected with constructive notice of the suit so as to bind the property in their hands by the judgment, it has been held that the clerk of a court in which was pending a suit for specific performance was constructively charged with notice of the nature of plaintiff's demands. Notice of the nature of the plaintiff's demand. Section 46, recitals in title papers. Perhaps as striking an example of the extent of this doctrine as could be found is the case of Pito v. Hammond, where a vendor's lien was retained in the deed to the grantor of the party charged, which deed had always remained in the original vendor's possession and the grantee of the party against whom the debt stood that was secured by the lien had never had an opportunity to inspect the instrument. Nevertheless, it was held that he had constructive notice of such lien for the reason that it was recited in a deed which formed a necessary link in his chain of title. But where such recital is relied upon as constructive notice, it must be in an instrument affecting the title to do the same piece of property to which such recital refers. Section 47, Possession of Deeds. Where the title deeds necessarily pass with the title and strict reliance is not placed upon the registry of instruments affecting land titles, notice that the title deeds of an estate are in the possession of someone else than the grantor is generally held to be constructive notice of whatever claim the one in possession of such deed had against the property.